We say to our people, don't look at Genesis 6 as supernatural. Don't dip into these resources that would actually help you read your New Testament in context. Don't do that. And of course, you're going to get to 1 Peter 3 and have no idea what to do with it. Um, this is actually fascinating. And I don't get into this in Unseen Realm. Uh, I do get into this a bit in Reversing Hermon, and again, a little bit in the Demon's Book. But Paul's talking about the law here. You know, why do we even have the law, okay? And he says, why then the law? It was added because of transgressions until the offspring should come to whom the promise had been made. And it, the law, was put in place through angels by an intermediary. Now, I do discuss the intermediary in Unseen Realm, but what I don't get into is the first part. Did you see that? Why do we have the law? It was added because of transgressions, plural. Now, if, you, if you're thinking, oh, you know, Gen Genesis 3. Well, first of all, you know, there's, a, there's a, a lot of time between Genesis 3 and the Israelite community, which is the, the, the offspring, the offspring of Abraham to whom the promise had been made. There's a lot of time, you know, gap there. But more significantly, we don't have multiple sins as the reason why Adam and Eve are driven out. We have one sin. They ate from the tree of life. So what is he talking about transgressions? Okay, here, here's a thought just to plant this in your head. Just whose transgressions are we talking about that led to the need for the law? See, in other passages, the law was given to, yes, teach us that we needed a savior. That's, you know, Paul says that. But he also said that the law was a restrainer. It restrained evil. It restrained the proliferation of evil. Believe it or not, in Second Temple Judaism, and again, you can just look at the footnotes at the sources that I told you about where I do discuss this. There were Jews who thought about the law this way. The law was given when, when God decided to carve out an elect community, you know, like to kickstart Eden again and, and get his people you know, he, he, he calls Abraham and then they wind up in Egypt and, you know, they, they, they're there for 400 years. And God told Abraham they would be there for 400 years in Genesis 15. He actually tells him that. But now when they come out and the, and the nation is born or reborn, God gives them the law because now they're going to be a kingdom of priests. They're going to be the conduit through which all of the nations come back. And through them, there's going to become one seed, the Messiah, who's going to fix all this mess. So the law is designed to protect them from evil, to restrain evil behavior, because evil has proliferated over the, the whole earth because of the transgressions, plural, of the watchers. That is the way a number of Second Temple Jewish writers took the relationship of the sin of the watchers to the law. And so scholars have asked, hmm, I wonder if that's what Paul's talking about here. The law was added because of transgressions. We needed the law because depravity had proliferated all over the earth. And if God is gonna you know, call out a people and, and they're gonna be right in the middle of this mess, they need some instruction. They need some instruction about how to be loyal to the true God and be a light to their world. Okay, just food for thought. Uh, again, I, I think there's really, there's, there's, a, there's a very interesting trajectory there. And then later in the class, we're gonna hit 1 Peter 3. But again, this is the passage where Peter's talking about the, the flood and Noah and angels that sin. And, you know, we, we've got, you know, spirits, you know, in chains, spirits in prison and the resurrection and, you know, the, you know again, the flood, the ark, you know, all this stuff kind of thrown into the hopper. And it, it looks totally bizarre. As I said in the last session, this is the passage where I actually went to church and the pastor who's doing a series on 1 Peter got to 1 Peter 3, 14 through 22 and said, we're just going to skip it. It's just too strange. 
if you, if you understand, again, the Enochic backstory, that just as Paul used Adam as a type, as a, a foreshadowing of Jesus, Peter uses Enoch and the whole Enoch story as a foreshadowing of what the gospel would mean. If you understand that much, 1 Peter 3, 14 through 22 is awesome. It makes baptism spiritual warfare. It's awesome. It's a great chapter. It's a great section. But see, we can't see that because we have been taught first to not see anything supernatural going on in Genesis 6. And if you're going to do that, well, then we'll add, well, don't ever read books that the New Testament writers read, like Enoch. Why? I mean, Enoch's not inspired, but a book doesn't have to be inspired to be important. Biblical writers read lots of books. They quote from lots of sources. Why, why shouldn't we read something that Peter or Jude read so that we can become a more intelligent reader of Peter and Jude? So we, we, we say to our people, don't look at Genesis 6, a supernatural. Don't dip into these resources that would actually help you read your New Testament in context. Don't do that. And of course, you're going to get to 1 Peter 3 and have no idea what to do with it. No kidding. 